Hey guys, I'm Eric at AeroGuard Flight Training Center and today we are going to start talking about IFR lost communications procedures. Uh, we're going to pretty much find all of the regulatory side of this in 91.185 and we're probably going to break this out into a lot of different example cases over time but uh, for right now I just kind of want to work through the process. Uh, and so, kind of to start off the, the flow chart that we, would, that we would have, the very first thing to, to ask ourselves uh, is, well, actually, very first thing is, are we actually lost communications, right? So, sometimes uh, it's best to just sort of run your own checklist of, are you on the correct frequency? Are you using the right radio? Did you try a secondary radio if you have one installed? Uh, are you sure volume is set correctly? all of those kinds of things. Uh, make sure that the, you're actually in a lost comm scenario before you go through the whole process uh, of, of following these procedures. But assuming you were and you find yourself squawking 7600, uh, we need to decide uh, what we're going to do, how we're going to safely navigate to uh, an airport to land. So the very first piece that it tells us to, to look at is the weather conditions that we're in, right? So it identifies either instrument meteorological conditions or visual meteorological conditions. And it says, if you are in VMC, then go VFR, right? Just go find an airport nearby, land, and everything is done. Uh, you can call, close your flight plan, explain what happened. I'm sure they'll know since they probably saw you squawking 7600 anyway. But anyway, this gets you on the ground safely and without any other issues. If, however, uh, that is not the case and you find yourself in IMC, uh, then you would need to follow these particular rules to ensure that you stay on the correct route and altitude and uh, ensure timing is, is correct as well. So what is interesting about this is, is uh, sometimes this gets kind of messed up a little bit. It's not a, at the very beginning, when you experience this lost communications, you make the choice whether you're going this way or this way. Uh, yes, that's true, but it's not indefinite. If at any time throughout your flight you experience VMC, you pop out of those clouds, then go VFR, right? So even if you're following this way, as soon as you come out of that weather, uh, you can immediately just go VFR and, and land uh, as soon as practical. So. Uh, I think that, that is kind of important. You can keep kind of bouncing back and forth, uh, meaning as long as you're in instrument meteorological conditions, you'll continue to follow what the rule says, but if at any point in time you experience VMC, stay VFR, <laughs> don't go back into the clouds, and land as soon as practical. Uh, okay, so now what I want to do is talk about uh, how this is broken out. So we're going to divide it up into three parts. We're going to talk about uh, how to determine the route to follow, how to determine what altitude to fly at, and when to leave your clearance limit. Uh, so first, let's talk a little bit about route. So switching over to the route, uh, the rule is kind of specific. It's going to go in a very exact order. So it's not choose one of these, it's instead going to follow a particular order. Uh, so I typically follow this acronym AREA. Uh, there's others that people have come up with for sure, but uh, AREA is the one that I typically use to help me remember this sequence or this order. So the very first one is whatever the assigned route was. So when you received your clearance, if ATC gave you routing all the way to your clearance limit, then you're going to follow that routing all the way there. If uh, you don't have any routing information or you, you, you're beyond that point in your flight, uh, if you were being radar vectored, for example, uh, and not on a specific route at that point, then if you were being radar vectored, it says you would go direct to uh, whatever fix or, or airway they were trying to get you to uh, on those radar vectors. Number three is if ATC told you to expect something, so if they, if they gave you an expected instruction to expect uh, a, a certain route after this point, right? So after this fix, expect blah, blah, blah. Uh, then you would want to do that if, if there's no other assigned routing after that point. 
And last, if you have nothing else to go off of, it's whatever you've filed in your flight plan to get you to your destination. So if none of these others are available, you would just go <coughs> as you've filed. Okay, uh, so I think that this clarifies at least that sequencing. Uh, I'm going to make several more videos that will go through a bunch of examples of how we would go through this, uh, but I think for now this at least breaks down uh, how this is going to work. Now let's switch over and we'll talk a little bit about altitude and how to choose which altitude uh, for each route segment. So switching gears, we're going to talk a little bit now about how to choose which altitude to fly at in this lost communications scenario. So uh, the rule tells us that we should choose the highest of these three uh, for each route segment. Um, and once again, we'll do a bunch of example cases uh, over time, but I, I wanted to kind of just run through what each of those three are. The first is a minimum IFR altitude. So minimum IFR altitudes would be things like the MEA for that Victor Airway, for example, uh, or minimum crossing altitudes, minimum reception altitudes, uh, if you're using that navigation, uh, or off-route obstacle clearance altitudes, whatever the case might be. Could be an MSA, whatever. Uh, these are the published IFR altitudes uh, for each route segment. Next is uh, an expected altitude. So if ATC told us to expect, let's say for example, they gave us an instruction like climb maintain 5,000, expect 10,000 in 10 minutes. Well then our assigned is 5,000 and our expected altitude is 10,000 uh, in 10 minutes. So after those 10 minutes have expired, then that expected altitude becomes valid and that's the altitude that would, that would be in play. Assigned, obviously, is whatever ATC has, has issued you as an altitude to fly at. Uh, so once again, for each route segment, we'll want to compare each of these three. And when we compare each of these three, we'll choose whichever is the highest, and therefore uh, we can uh, then fly at that altitude for the remainder of, of that route uh, segment. Good. So our last piece is going to be choosing when to leave the clearance limit. Uh, this is generally going to happen near the end of our uh, flight, but in either case, uh, let's dive into what that's going to look like next. Last piece that we want to get through is when to leave the clearance limit. So uh, to go through this piece, I think it's really important that we kind of break it down into sort of like a, like a flow chart again. Uh, and so. Uh, I'm just going to ask a series of questions and that will help us kind of navigate to which of the four answers we should basically follow, right? So the first is, is the clearance limit an initial approach fix? So IAF means initial approach fix. So if the answer is uh, yes, we're going to go this way. If the answer is no, we're going to go this way. Uh, in either case, we're also then going to ask, uh, did we receive an expect further clearance time or EFC time. So let's say uh, we did receive a, a clearance limit that was an initial approach fix and uh, we did get an EFC time, then we would simply get to that initial approach fix. We would hold there until our EFC time and then we could proceed in on the approach. If the EFC time has already lapsed, then as soon as we get to the initial approach fix, we just continue immediately inbound on the approach. If we were not given an EFC time, then we would leave that clearance limit at our expected time of arrival. Uh, so whatever that, that might be, uh, that's when we would ultimately leave our, uh, that, that initial approach fix out on the approach. So on the other side, if our clearance limit was not an initial approach fix, then we still ask ourselves, did we receive uh, an, an expect further clearance time? Uh, if we did, then we would wait at that clearance limit until the EFC, then we would proceed to an initial approach fix uh, to, to, to shoot that particular approach. If we did not receive an expect further clearance time, uh, then as soon as we get to that clearance limit, we'd immediately leave and go to a place where we can begin an initial, uh, we'd go to an initial approach fix 
uh, then we'd leave that initial approach fix at the ETA. So that's kind of the, uh, the plan all the way through. Um, so it's kind of based on really two variables, right? If the clearance limit is an initial approach fix, and if we have an expect further clearance time. Uh, so those two questions really are, are the two pieces that are going to direct you as to which of these four will be the solution. Okay guys, so hopefully this has been helpful as we just kind of talked about the basic structure of this regulation for dealing with a uh, lost communication scenario in, uh, in IMC. Uh, what we're going to do is continue to make more videos uh, that will go through some example cases. That way we can really start to explore each of these options. Uh, a little bit further and use some sort of exact uh, examples to help articulate what we should do. Um, those will be forthcoming. Anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Bye.